Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions, and today we're going to be talking about water conservation strategies, uh, specifically five steps that you can take this afternoon after the webinar to reduce your landscape water use. And you know, as we think about this, uh, and, and we're going to hear from Andy Bellingeri on this today, but if you think about it, what, uh, what, what our goal here is really to provide five steps that you can leave today, start. It doesn't cost a lot of money, doesn't cost a lot of labor, but most importantly, can uh, make a significant difference in how much you're paying for water and how much you're using water. And uh, certainly with the drought the way it is uh, and the way it continues, right? I say the way it is this year, but the way it really has been continuing, uh, this has become more important than ever. Uh, so today uh, taking us on this journey is uh, Andy Bellingeri. He's the national sales manager for uh, Jane's uh, and uh, Jane Irrigation. And Andy, um, the thing I really appreciate about Andy, you know, Andy and I have a long history of working together. We worked together at Valleycrest. Uh, prior to um, uh, uh, working at Valleycrest, you know, Andy was a horticultural major at um, uh, BYU. And the thing I really appreciate about Andy is he's got a great background, uh, educational background and understanding of horticulture. He's worked at Valley Crest where he actually ran crews in the field before becoming a business developer and now working uh, for Jane uh, in manufacturing for the last seven years. He really has this full circle perspective on what's happening in the industry. And uh, he really does a great job for his customers and Jane as a result of that. So uh, Andy, welcome. Uh, appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you. As always, the, uh, the kind introduction. I'm glad to be uh, here with everybody. Yeah, so Andy, you know, the one thing uh, I, I wanted to say, and I, you're out of uh, Henderson, Nevada today. Uh, you guys are, uh, Nevada's actually seeing a, a big part of the drought, right? Uh, and I think you're, you're definitely going to talk about that. But I'm, in general, I'm just wondering how bad is the drought this year? It's bad. I, it was CBS or USA Today, uh, one of these the past couple of days, I saw the term mega drought. And I don't know who coined that term or how long it's been around. But that was the uh, that's the latest term I've heard is mega drought. <laughs> yeah. Well, I you know, look. I, I was looking too, and I saw that in New Mexico, uh, farmers on the uh, banks of the Rio Grande are being asked not to uh, grow anything this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something we've not seen before. I know that Lake Mead, right, very close to you, that uh, provides a lot of water for Nevada, Las Vegas, in particular, Arizona, and Southern California. You know, it's, it's going to see some, uh, I think we're going to see some cutbacks in, uh, in, in how much water is released there. So uh, yeah. it's kind of a different ball game this year. We, we might have stepped into new territory. Well, and hopefully the new territory is people actually put into practice things that they have known about for many years. You know, water conservation strategy is nothing new. In fact, these five steps we'll go through today. Um, each one of these steps uh, you've been able to do for sure the least in the last 10 years, maybe the past 15 or even 20 years, uh, maybe technology has gotten a little bit better, but sometimes the biggest thing, and you mentioned this in the beginning, Richard, we hope that at the end of this webinar, people go home today and implement these practices. Uh, that is the key. Will we implement them as, as gardeners, as landscapers, as homeowners, as stewards of, of the planet? Will we, will we implement these practices that we know work? Uh, it reminds me of the story. Uh, it's it's kind of corny, but it's the story of the turkeys that learned how to fly and then they walked home. So we don't want to be those turkeys, right? <laughs> Right. I think it's interesting too, Andy, because a lot of people say, oh, gee, you know, people get really interested in water management when, in, when, when we're in a drought and they say, gee, it's too late if you're trying to manage water now. But uh, these, these uh, situations last for multiple years. I mean, the one we're in now, I think, is over is really, you know, over 10 years of drought. And, uh, and I think we have to pay attention to it every day. So I, I think that's a great point, Andy. Yeah, well, thanks. You know, you had mentioned Lake Mead. Um, and I wanted to share this picture here, if you don't mind jumping into it right now, but uh, this is 1983. This is Lake Mead. This is looking from the Arizona side of the Hoover Dam. You can see Hoover Dam there in the background. I was uh, probably seven years old, uh, six or seven years old when this picture was taken. I didn't take the picture, of course, 
But I remember being there on that day. It, uh, and maybe the first time in the history, the only time in the history of Lake Mead where the water was actually going over this big spillway. And uh, it was quite the sight to see. I remember standing there. Um, I've stood next to a, a rushing train before, not next, very close, but close enough to feel the ground shake. The, the, the only way to describe the, the feeling of that water, the amounts of water gushing over the spillway and the rumbling and the roar is to the feeling you get standing next to a rushing train. It was quite amazing. Um, something that in my young uh, six-year-old, seven-year-old mind was certainly etched into my memory. And that was Lake Mead in 1983. Uh, so, in the year 2000, Lake Mead was almost that full. The water didn't go over the spillway, but it was almost that full. The sad thing is three short years later, in 2003, that's Lake Mead. That's probably down 70 feet maybe. Well, um, one more decade passed, you know, the, there's another 30 foot drop, you know, close to 100 feet down. Um, and then we see it today. This is Lake Mead um, in 2021, uh, 130 feet vertical feet down. Um, it's dropped 130 feet. As it sits right now, I want to say Lake Mead's level is 1,079 feet above sea level. At 1,075 feet, so when it drops four more feet, uh, the, the Colorado River goes into automatic cutbacks. That's like that's been the, the trigger point for these cutbacks that people have been talking about for years. Um, last I heard, I think they expect that uh, level to, us to reach that level sometime in August of this year. So it'll it'll happen this year and these cutbacks will go into effect. So Andy, is there a chance you're going to get some rain this summer and get out of that or? Well, so yeah, yeah, rain. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we had the longest stretch that I've ever known of. And I know we broke records uh, from March of last year, right at the beginning of COVID it rained. And then we didn't get rain for like nine or 10 months. And it, at that point, it was just a trace of rain. And, uh, you know, so we, yeah, you just don't, you don't get the, 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 the as much rain. Now, we could have a downpour in Vegas, and I don't know that it would have a, a huge effect on Lake Mead. Of course, what we want is snow in the mountains. What we see in, in Colorado and Utah, the Colorado River Basin to fill that. Unfortunately, so here we have Lake Mead at its one of its lowest points since it is at the lowest point in its history since the, the reservoir was filled. It has never been this low um, since the time the reservoir is filled. That's where we're at today. But then we see here the US drought monitor. And you can see right here, this is the Colorado River. This is the Colorado River Basin. This is the area right here that feeds the Colorado River. So you talk about rainfall. Yeah, a little bit of rainfall in Vegas might raise the level Lake Mead by a quarter of an inch. But really what you need is in, you know, up around uh, the, the Rockies, all that, and the, the Wasatch Front in Utah, all that snow melt to feed the river. But here we are in a mega drought. Um, you look at that Colorado River Basin and the majority of the basin is in D4, exceptional drought, uh, with some of it being in D3, uh, which is an extreme drought. But uh, they're talking about snow is uh, what they thought would melt and run off is melting and absorbed into the soil and not getting run off to feed the river. They're talking about snow evaporating. Um, really vaporizing before it even has a chance to melt. So it really is kind of a, uh, an extreme or exceptional, I guess, according to the U.S. Drought Monitor, it's an exceptional environment we're in right now. And I think one of the things that contributed the, to this, Andy, and this was a question, was the, uh, the monsoon last year, right, was more yeah. of a non-soon than a monsoon? Yeah, and yeah, I was, I was going to mention that. Yeah, so that, during that stretch, uh, all of last summer, we did not have any rain, and the, the monsoon was the nonsoon. I know Phoenix was the same way. It was the nonsoon. I don't know this year. I will see what happens this summer, but uh, we just did not get summer rains last year. Yeah, well, and you should have had some already, right? I mean, this is, uh, have you experienced any of the monsoon yet? We've had a couple overcast days, nothing yet, nothing of, of note. I think, uh in the past six months, we may have received a fraction of an inch, um, you know, a tenth of an inch. There hasn't been a lot. Of course, this is where I live. You, you look at maybe out in the spring mountain range, they got a little bit more. You know, other areas are getting some, but not not like what we're used to. It is still, um, it's, 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 it's a drought, the, the mega drought. 
the technology. Yeah. So, well, um, as landscapers, as gardeners, uh, as growers and st as stewards of the environment, what can we do about this? Yeah, so hey, well, first I wanna say, I look, at, I look down in Southern California, Richard, you're down in the San Diego area. I look down there and you, you might say, hey, we're just in moderate drought. I don't have to really do anything. You know, you guys in Nevada, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, you guys have to figure it out. But when you consider for a second, the population centers that rely on the Colorado River, you look at the, the Phoenix, Tucson population center, the LA, Orange County, and uh, San Diego County population center, all of a sudden what happens up in Colorado and Wyoming to feed the Colorado River really impacts, uh, you know, you guys in Southern California, the Colorado River provides drinking water to 40 million people. That's about two thirds of the Western United States. That's not getting into the farmers and everybody else who's relying on this water. And, and so we, we think about that and then we think, okay, the typical single family home water use, half of the water the single family home is using is used outdoors in the landscape. Now, it might be as high as 75% in the desert, it might be a little bit lower in the mountains, but on average, what we see is 50% of the water used is used outdoors in the landscape. So right off the bat, as landscapers, we have a target on our back, as I've, as I've heard uh, said before. There's a target on our back for the water we're using, but it gets even worse from there, um, or good, depending on, on how you want to look at this. 50% of the water that we're using outdoors is being wasted from either inefficient irrigation mess methods or runoff or overspray or other wasteful uh, practices. So half the water we're using is used outdoors in landscapes. Half of that is being wasted because of inefficient methods. Um, that tells me if my math is correct, well, there's an opportunity to save 25% right off the bat, just through, uh, through our uh, smarter irrigation practices in the landscape. There's, a, there's an opportunity to reduce our water bill by or water usage by by up to 25 percent. Yeah, I, I want to stress how important that is, Andy, um, because we're not talking about, uh, you know, we're not talking about in golf, you're shooting 70 and trying to get to 68, you know, something that can be impossible that takes hours and hours. We're really, you know, looking at I'm shooting 120 and I want to get to 105 or I want to break 100. It's very doable. And if I'm a contractor and I can save my customers water and money and I can show them this and it doesn't take much to do, I'm going to attract a lot more customers, aren't I? Yeah, absolutely. You, you are. And, you know, it's uh, there is there is some good news in all this. Number one, the good news is it's very doable. We can do it. And number two, um, you know, landscapes, we create landscapes because it, it uh, you know, the feeling, the, the, the sense of place, you know, it's part of our outdoor living It's part of it adds joy and variety and 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 um, um, more of a refined, elevated uh, um, lifestyle to our existence. Right. So the good news is. Our landscapes don't have to look like this picture here. <laughs> you know, so often people think water conservation means gray rocks, you know, the wagon wheel and bull skull. I think the only thing that's missing here is a, uh, a little uh, garden gnome or something, but uh, it doesn't have to look that way. Um, it can look like this. This is why we create landscapes because it, uh, of, of the, the emotional and, and uh, impact it has on our lives, right? It, it, creates, it creates good moods. Of course, you've seen the hospital studies where if people are able to look at a landscape, they heal faster. We all know those stories. The good news is we can have beautiful landscapes and reduce water. They are not mutually exclusive. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that, uh, specifically how to do that today in five simple steps. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's a great point, Andy. And, you know, we lived it, we saw the revenues that we could drive as a result of uh, making this change. And, uh, you know, I, I tell almost anybody who will listen, we, uh, we pulled in an extra $20 million just in irrigation uh, revenue uh, over three years. Uh, as a result of using this as a pitch, we didn't, that doesn't even consider the extra maintenance jobs we picked up as a result of uh, promoting our water management services. So, uh, boy, it's, uh, it's some, there's some low hanging fruit out there uh, for, for a lot of contractors.
there is, uh, yeah, from a business perspective, there is an opportunity to, to, to make money. But also I think is, uh, you know, those of us that work in the landscape industry, water management industry, uh, I, most people I know, it's their passion, their hearts, in it. They're, they're really, um, you know, driven intrinsically to, uh, to, to create beautiful spaces or, you know, use water efficiency. So not only is there the opportunity from a business perspective to, to have financial gains, but there's also that, that uh, the idea of, of, of who we are um, uh, as, as human beings, this intrinsic nature, the intrinsic value, the, uh, the, the altruistic nature of, of wanting to improve our surroundings. Let's find a way to use less water, you know, be, be, uh, be better stewards of, of the natural resources that we've been given. And I think that's, uh, that's part of, uh, of, of who we are as landscape professionals in general. I think that's kind of at the heart of, uh, of what we do and that, that needs to be part of the drive. Um, so with that said, there's, you know, these are, these are five, five steps you can take. Um, and th these are the steps we'll review today, you know, reducing plant water demand, maximizing irrigation efficiency, uh, enabling precision control of irrigation, uh, using new technology, and then of course, uh, the competent operator skills. And that's from uh, maybe company owner down to uh, gardener on the crew, we can all increase our, uh, our, our skill set. Yeah, two, two things here, Andy. One, I want to remind everybody the chat and the Q&A are open. If you have some questions or uh, comments, put them in there and I will relay them to Andy when appropriate. And then the other thing I want to know, Andy, is, I mean, there's really a hundred or hundreds of uh, things we could do. Why'd you pick these five? Uh, these five, because they're, they're, they're simple, they're easy. It's something that everybody could do today. It does not require, it does not require too much. It's something that's, that can be easily implemented. Um, we talk about that low hanging fruit, about 25% of the landscape water that's being, that's being wasted. This is how we get that. And we can get it relatively easily. Simple, it's a simple plan. Yeah, great, love to hear them. Okay, so step one, let's reduce the plant water demand. And I put here, there's up to a 30% savings. If we're looking at, at, at everything we're trying to save, 30% savings, and I'll walk through how I came up with that number. First step is, is plant selection. And this is, this is kind of basic. So let's make sure we're using the right plant material in the right location. Uh, having been a landscape contractor, worked in the landscape here in Las Vegas area, it was so common to see a landscape architect from coastal Southern California design a landscape in the Mojave Desert in Las Vegas, one of the driest places in North America. And then um, we'd be sitting there scratching our heads thinking, how are we gonna keep this alive without dumping massive amounts of water on a plant? And even then it was only gonna look so-so. Um, you, can, you can use less water and have a better looking landscape by choosing the right plant material. That can be either native or adapted uh, plant material. There are beautiful, the desert has very beautiful uh, um, plant material, plant choices. I look at some of the, uh, the, the desert adapted plant material that grows around here, the golden barrel cactus, bird of paradise, some of these gopher plants, these things, uh, lantana and, and uh, uh, the, uh, some of these other plants. The flower display is just beautiful. The reds, the yellows, the blues, the whites, oranges, it really puts on a beautiful, beautiful display. So you can have a beautiful landscape that is um, um, not using a lot of water. Um, one of the other things under plant selection, we, you know, turf has a place, right? There is a place for turf, but maybe we had to make a decision. Are we using a cool season grass or are we using a warm season grass? Uh, just switching from a cool season grass to a warm season grass, say going from fescue to Bermuda, you can reduce your water usage by about 30% right there alone. And part of that is not just that the Bermuda needs less water, but Bermuda will go dormant in the winter and, and not require as much water. And especially if you, if you don't overseed, you can, you, there's a water savings there. So um, that's just one example of a, a couple examples of plant selection. Um, another way to reduce plant water demand then is our site design. How are we designing our site? Do we need, do we really need wall to wall turf grass from, from curb to, to front porch? Um, maybe it's better to replace uh, that turf with low water use shrubs. And uh, I, I gotta I have a picture here. Um, you see this strip of grass between the street and the sidewalk. 
I think the technical term for this is the boulevard, but I think uh, my favorite term I've heard is the stupid strip. <laughs> it is, it really is, is, is just a dumb place to put grass. Not only is it non-functional, it just, it looks pretty, but it is in very hard to irrigate. So you end up with most of your water on the street or on the sidewalk. Uh, when it comes to, to, to turf grass, now I am, I, uh, and I'll be honest, I, I am not one of these turf grass uh, um, Nazis who, you know, all turf grass has got to go. I enjoy grass. I enjoy natural grass, but I think it needs to be functional. It needs to be, you know, for, for recreation, for playing sports, for, for you know, laying on a, on a blanket, having a picnic, nothing beats real grass. But I think the stuff we need to get rid of is the non-functional turf. And my rule of thumb is this. If the only time you step on it is to mow it, it probably needs to go. Yeah, that's that's actually a great rule of thumb, Andy. And I look at the stupid strips and I think, uh, well, this is actually a great candidate for drip irrigation in these. But what has happened is, you know, most of them were designed and installed in the 70s and 80s and they're spray heads. And, uh, you know, one spray head every five feet or something. I mean, they're, they're way over irrigating uh, just, just because of the actual design of, of the irrigation systems that were done for these. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting, speaking of this non-functional turf, um, Nevada just passed a law and it's uh, it, non-functional turf needs to be removed. All of it needs to be removed. I want to say it's by 2025 or 2027. And uh, that's true for, for commercial, but also for residential as well. Uh, if, it's, if it's decorative grass, it needs to go. And so, uh, they, they, yeah, they, so where this is different from the past has been you couldn't install it. But now what they're saying, Andy, is if you have it, you got to get rid of it. You, yeah, exactly. So several years ago, there was a law, no, no turf on new homes in the front yard. And now the lie is if it's just if it's just ornamental, if it's just decoration, it's got to go away. And there's a lot of large commercial properties where you see it there entryway. They just have grass right on the corner of a busy street. Nobody's sitting on that. It's just it's just decoration. Um, and so the lie is now that that will need to be removed. And Sorry, Andy, I'm just fascinated by this. So um, who determines if it's ornamental or useful? You know, it's interesting. I don't know that that has been quite determined yet if they're going to have uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority water cops out again doing that. I, I'm not I'm not sure. I uh, that, that's, that's a great question. But, you know, they, you look at kind of the, the spirit of it, of, of what they're trying to achieve. And there's some very obvious stuff that's out there. And they they estimated very conservative low end estimate based on the obvious um, candidates that are out there. That will reduce Southern Nevada's demand of the Colorado River by 10%. Yeah. And potentially more. Yeah. And that's a lot. And, you know, I, but I've always been a fan of, uh, uh, well, haven't been a fan of prescriptive and uh, more of a fan of performance based uh, irrigation management, right? Uh, I think a lot of people is, uh, you know, uh, resent it. And so as a result, they, they try to fight it. Yeah. Yeah. You'll see a lot of people possibly having picnics out on, uh, on turf they never stepped on before. But I, there is still the incentive there, a little bit of the carrot, and that is I think they're still offering money, um, uh, the cash for grass, the grass program uh, that's out there. So. Yeah, so and I see we got a comment here that says uh, the function is to keep the neighborhood dogs out of your front yard. And uh, yeah, that's a whole different problem. That is, yeah, that is, that is, you know, you again, I mean, we talk about cultural that was a point c here in reducing plant water demand you know it's it's all cultural but um dogs and leaving waste behind that's another cultural practice if you're out walking your dog and your dog does his business if you can't pick it up and carry off your dog's waste I mean, it's the same if you can't if you can't not waste water these are cultural things it's, it requires this isn't a government program this isn't a magic wand this isn't a uh you know somebody makes a law and then it happens it's on us. Each of us as individuals can make the difference in the world. And, you know, if we each do a little, we all do a lot is the old saying. But, uh, you know, speaking of cultural practices, a couple more to reduce the plant water demand, the application of mulch, and whether it's mulching mowers or using mulch in your landscape around shrubs and trees. For those uh, of us in the desert, um, 
decorative rock, believe it or not, is a mulch. You pick up any rock in the desert, on the bottom side of that rock, it's going to be moist because it's, it's holding that water in. So mulch is a great cultural practice to reduce plant water demand. Aerating your turf uh, and mow height are two specifically for grass if you wanted to reduce the water demand of, of grass. Aerate uh, frequently and, and set your, your mower to the highest position. Um, and you'll, you'll get deeper roots and a better, uh, more efficient use of, of plant water. Yeah, so we have a question here, Andy, uh, from one of our viewers, and he's asking, uh, do, is there ever a good reason to pick up the grass clippings off your, uh, off your yard? Um, I guess if there was a disease or fungus, there might be. Uh, typically, the, the rule of thumb is, uh, you, know, you know, following the rule of thumb, use a mulcher, a mulching mower. I want to say something like 70 or 80 percent of, if you pick up a, a blade of grass, 70 or 80 percent of that is water that's in there. The rest of it, um, you know, is, is going to be forms of nitrogen, other nutrients. I think like 5% of it might be carbon. So people think, oh, if I don't, if I don't pick it up, it's just going to add to the thatch layer. That's not true. Thatch is entirely different. Um, you're returning water and nutrients to, uh, to the, uh, to, to, to your lawn, unless there was a disease. I'm sure there's some other instances I'm not uh, thinking of right off the top of my head, but you know, generally speaking, it's best to mulch. Yeah, I love that, right? Uh, it re replaces some water, replaces some nitrogen, and you're not hauling that grass all the way to the landfill. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, very good point. That's, that, that reduces your mow time. It gives you more time to uh, sit in the shade with a glass of lemonade or iced tea or whatever your beverage of choice is. <laughs> all right, so here we are, step two. Um, step two is maximizing irrigation efficiency. And I, I think there's a 10 to 20% savings here. And right off the bat, the first thing we want to do to maximize irrigation efficiency is aim for a high uniform, uniformity of application, 75% or more. Uh, most systems right now, spray systems uh, specifically, are probably in the 30 to 50% range. And you know, you know, Richard, I thought you had a really good definition for uh, when we talk about distribution uniformity or uniformity of application. I, I thought yeah, the what you mentioned earlier was really good. Yes, I always look at it as uh, rain on my landscape, right? When when it rains, uh, it's really uniform, right? It's spread evenly all across my landscape. That's just the way uh, Mother Nature provides for it. And uh, how closely your irrigation system matches that is. Uh, the distribution uniformity. Yeah. And what we see is most spray systems are not uniform. You end up way overwatering some, underwatering other areas. And anyway, so that's that's where you see these systems in the 30 to 50 percent range, which means you have to apply more water. Um, and that's where you end up with waste and inefficiency. So if you can aim for a system at 75 percent or more, you're really uh, you're really getting into the, the, the sweet spot there, uh, irrigation efficiency. You're the I other place. Yeah. The other place where we can learn from this, Andy, is uh, you know you listen to some of these um, the uh, ag lunch and learns, and they talk about eighty five percent DU is like the minimum, and they really want to be over ninety. And when you drive by a farm field, this is why you know all the plants are the same size and looking beautiful and healthy. Is the distribution uniformity is so good? And like you say, when we talk in landscape, thirty to fifty percent DU, man, we we. <laughs> This is some low-hanging fruit, right? We can get a lot better here. It is, and I'll get into this a little bit more in a couple of slides, but I think most of the irrigation across the country, the vast majority of it, I think is dependent on technology that's almost 100 years old, and that's a, a spray head. You look at the, the basic spray head, I don't think that technology has changed a whole lot, and we're, we're, we're following practices that are, that are you know, 70 to 100 years old when we could really step it up and it, it's time we do so um you know one of the one of the practices too you see this a lot in sp speaking of spray when you see this system you see kind of a mist hanging up above it um that's just it gets into pressure management sometimes that, that can be the cause but managing pressure so you look at our sprinkler systems they should operate I think most are designed to operate around 40 PSI, you know, 30 to 40 PSI. Every manufacturer is slightly different, but they should be operating, generally speaking, under 40 PSI. My guess is most systems are operating over 55 PSI just because whatever the pressure is coming in from the street, that's what, the, uh, that's what they're operating at. And that leads to a lot of waste uh, as well. So 
um, regulating pressure, simple pressure regulator, um, or you know having pressure regulating valves or or pressure regulating uh, spray devices. Your, your your device itself to regulate pressure could make a, a big difference in your system efficiency. And then of course we talk about the precipitation rate. And what that means is if I have ten sprinklers in a zone, each sprinkler should be putting down the same amount of water in inches per minute or gallons per minute. What we see sometimes is one sprinkler is putting down, let's say, you know, for even numbers, one gallon per minute of water and the other is putting down half a gallon per minute of water. And you just end up overwatering one area or underwatering the other. Um, so when we, we talk about system efficiency, we want to look at precipitation rate or precip rate and make sure that the precipitation rate is matched across the zone. So we're not overwatering one and underwatering the other. Of course, it's, it's, it's a no brainer controlling overspray and runoff. Um, having a, a spray pattern that, that isn't watering your sidewalk or a drip zone that's running so long that the, the water just runs off, you know, puddles and runs off before it can soak in. So, you know, we want to make sure that uh, we're, we're doing that. And then really basic, basic, basic thing that I still think happens often enough is maintaining your system. Are you inspecting your valves and your heads and your nozzles to make sure they're not plugged, that they're not broken, that they really are working the way they should? If you have a, a plug up nozzle, you, you get a dry spot. I can tell you most contractors think, well, I got a dry spot. I got to I got to add more minutes to the entire system. And you get into a point where, you know, 95% of your landscape then becomes overwatered so that 5% could get just enough where in reality, if you just made that one repair, you could, you could really reduce your, your water usage. Yeah, no, oftentimes we know contractors uh, go for a, uh, a monthly uh, wet check on a system or uh, this is what they see on a lot of specifications. And uh, I've seen a few customers uh, requesting uh, a, a wet check after every mowing. Yeah. And man, uh, we've been surprised at uh, how much water we save as a result of finding these issues because it's not just the mowing, uh, especially in turf areas. If it's usable turf, you know, these things are kicked and, and uh, damaged. Um, most irrigation systems are really tough, you know, but man, they're operating in some tough conditions. And uh, as a result, you, you see these things quite easily. Yeah. Yeah, the old saying is you uh, you inspect what you expect. If you expect to have water savings or a, a properly uh, operating irrigation system, you have to inspect it. You have to get out there and look at it frequently. All right, so the next step, step three, this is precision pre precision control of irrigation. What I call a Goldilocks drill. We know we all know the story of Goldilocks. One bed was too hard, the other was too soft, the third one was just right. And that's what we're getting at with irrigation. We want it to be just right, just the right amount of water, right? Um, and how do we do that? Well, uh, it, it's very obvious. We, we match the irrigation to the, the plant demands. Um, what, what are the plant demands? Well, that could vary based on your weather and based on your plant type. And uh, we'll talk about some technology in the next slide that can do that automatically. But you know, if I have a cactus, um, I'm not going to water it nearly as much as I'm going to water a, uh, uh, my, my, my petunias, for example. Um, they have different water needs. And uh, not just plant types, but also root depth of those plants. So if you look at this graphic on the right, I've got uh, a very small shrub, a medium-sized shrub, and a large tree. And you can see each of those has a different root zone. And so we want to then make sure we're putting the water to the correct root depth. If I had, uh, if I was applying the same amount of water to the plant on the left as I did to the tree on the right, um, I would greatly overwater that plant on the left, right? Or if I could, if the opposite, I could underwater the, uh, the tree on the right. So understanding where the roots are in the soil and putting the water to their root zone becomes critical as well. Uh, it gets into the precision control of our irrigation. And uh, how do we do that in practice? Um, well, we call it hydrozoning. Um, I shouldn't have my trees and my flowers 
on the same on the same zone because they have different root systems and different water requirements. My trees should be on their valve together. My turf should be on its own valve. My low water use shrubs should be on its own valve. High water use shrubs, if you have any, should be on it on their own valve. That way you can uh, you can match plant material and and water needs accordingly. One of the biggest mistakes I see made is is uh, spray turf spray zones um, mixed with uh, drip shrub all in the same zone, and either the turf is a swamp or the uh, shrubs end up drying out. So we, we got to separate those things and hydrozone them. And uh, by doing that, not only do we have improved plant health, but we also, we end up saving water because we're, we're, we're getting into the uh, just right amount of water, not too much, not too little. And uh, uh, we increase our efficiency. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions here, Andy, from the audience. The first one is uh, all those zones, right? Uh, sounds expensive, is it? Um, I get to find expensive, right? I mean, installing any zone could be expensive. Why don't I just stand out there with a hose? Um, yeah, I might save, I might save a hundred dollars on day one, but how many, how much time am I paying somebody to stand out there with the hose and water? How much water am I wasting? Um, you know, any good design, um, done right up front is going to, is going to pay for itself down the road. Um, I look at windows, you know, if I'm building a home, why would I buy the cheap single pane window and not the, the double pane, uh, well insulated window that's going to reduce over the term, you know, 30 year term that I live in my house, reduce both my heating bill and my, my cooling bill. It's no different than when we're designing our landscape. Yeah, I, I might spend an extra $25 per zone to do it right, but how much, how much money am I saving in water usage in the long run? How much money am I saving in plant replacement because I'm not overwatering or underwatering? And how much money am I saving in in labor? Um, you know, it, it it really does add up, and that's we we need to, we need to be thinking long term in that. And I think that the the, uh, the buzzword for that is sustainable. We need to be thinking from a sustainable sustainability standpoint. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Andy, and I think um, I think you're actually a great example, right? You live in a home that uh, was was uh, promoted as uh, green and sustainable. You have a lot of things in your, in your home that show that. And I think a lot of home builders, you know, might uh, skip or skimp on extra valve zones because yeah, two or three or four more extra zones per house. If you have one house, isn't a big deal, but if you're building literally thousands of houses, right? This is where it really starts to add up for them. And by the way, they're not gonna save on the water bill anyway, eventually. So. Right. Well, I, I hope that more home builders are promoting this concept of sustainable or water saving landscapes in, in, in their homes, because I really do think people will pay up or at least be attracted to those homes more to start with. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, on, on us as homeowners, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, after the fact, a lot of us have inherited, um, you know, what we have, we can correct that. But, um, you know, speaking directly to the landscape contractors out there, um, and I throw myself in with you because I'm, I'm talking to some of the same people you are. It's on us to educate our property managers, our community managers, the, the uh, facility engineers or homeowners of a better way. And not just from the financial standpoint uh, in water savings and in plant health, the savings there, but also from, you know, it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. The altruistic standpoint, um, you know, it's, it's, it's our duty to, to educate them that there is a better way. And uh, I, I am convinced that people make the decisions they typically make because they, don't, they just don't know any better. Uh, as soon as they know better, as soon as they know, hey, if I pay a little bit more for this, I get you know, that in return, um, most people will, will see the value there and do it. Um, but the key is the, the education. Yeah, good point, Andy. And uh, we, we have another question here. And, uh, Somebody wants to know, uh, well, how do I know how deep the root system is in my plant? Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. Okay, so you could, uh, uh, I wish I had a picture of it. Golf course uh, superintendents have a slick little tool. It takes a, it can take a, a, a probe of soil. So for turf grass, it tells you how deep the water is, but you can also see how deep the root, roots are. That's one way to do it. Um, and if, if you don't have a shovel and you can't dig down, a lot of times you can look at the plant material itself. You can do a little bit of research, you know, where are the plant roots, where are they growing? 
it might be 12 inches. You know, for a tree, how deep is it going to be? Um, you know, talk to your landscape professional, a horticulturist, an arborist. A lot of it might depend on the soil types in the area you live in as well. I can tell you here in, in the, uh, the Las Vegas suburbs where they compact the heck out of the soil to build a really sturdy home, um, you have this really tight soil. A lot of times the, the, the roots don't get as deep. So in trees, we'll see the, uh, a lot of the roots in the top 12 inches of the soil, they just don't get any deeper because uh, a lack of, of oxygen um, in these compacted soils. So it, uh, uh, you can dig down, you can uh, consult a horticulturist or, a, or an arborist in your area and they'll be able to, to tell you for that plant species and your, in your area where those roots are. Um, internet's a good, uh, can be a good source of information as well. So it, uh, um, if you don't know, uh, your cooperative extension, master gardeners, uh, horticulturists, the uh, landscape contractor, horticulturist, arborist, those are great resources of information that can help you out. Yeah, great points, Andy. Yeah, and I, I check with all the colleges too. Um, yeah. They usually have the uh, extension groups that uh, have that information available. Yeah. A lot of the cooperative extensions should have, at least in the West, uh, they'll, they'll publish plant material that's either native or, or wa low water use, water-wise plant material, how tall it gets, how deep the roots get, how often, they'll have a lot of that information for you. Um, and, uh, you know, there's cultural practices you could follow specific to your uh, location. Yeah. Andy, we have another question and uh, it's from one of our viewers and he's wondering about, you know, he says what he's seeing is that um, when the water agencies raise rates, uh, oftentimes what people do is they just stop watering altogether. You know, they don't pull out their turf yeah. and make it a more drought tolerant and beautiful landscape. Instead, they just say, well, I can't afford this. I might be on fixed income or there's another reason why I can't afford the increase. So I'm just gonna cut back completely and save, but then it deteriorates the neighborhood. So what, what, what do you have to say about that? Oh, that's tough, man. Cause uh, I mean, it, I guess it, it's possible. You could really be in that scenario where I just, I just can't afford it. Um, again, I think there's, there's the education aspect of it. I think sometimes you just have to show them the way there is a way it's like, uh, um, I remember younger thinking I'm never going to retire it's impossible you know well there is there is a path and as soon as you can show somebody the path you can see beyond the immediate um, problem that looks like it's insurmountable as soon as you can see a path beyond that um, you know it becomes doable it uh, you know it, it, it may require an adjustment of of, of, uh, of maybe what you're used to but the the uh, I, I, I think you just you show people the way um, there are, uh, you know, I think every water authority pictures, they'll, they'll, they'll do awards. Hey, look at this water wise uh, landscape plant palette and how pretty it can be. And, um, you know, there's sometimes you just got to paint the picture a little bit. Um, that, that one's tough. That one's tough. Uh, well, Andy, I'm glad you mentioned the municipalities because, um, you know, especially here in Southern California, where everybody's water bill is now more than their electric bills. Um, we are getting a lot of um, rebate offers from the municipalities, right? 30 bucks a station for a smart controller, um, uh, rebates for taking out turf uh, on a per, per square foot basis that oftentimes will pay for 50 to almost 100% of what you're doing. So I, I think that's another place to look uh, is these municipality rebates. I think they're, um, uh, uh, they, they can really help uh, move this along. Very good point. I know for a time people in Vegas they were getting five dollars per square foot of turf to, to take out their, their turf and, and landscapers were charging like two dollars a square foot to do it. Homeowners are thinking, well, I just made some money right here. And it uh, you know, you, you gotta make you gotta make sure you're getting a good design from your your, your contractor, not fly by night guy. But regardless, yeah, there are very good point, Richard. There are ways to to help cover those expenses for sure. Yeah, no, and that, I mean, think about it. Um, you know, we were talking about ag water earlier, right? Two bucks a square foot in San Diego to take out your turf. So $86,000 to take out an acre of turf, but uh, you, know, you can put in a drip system on, for most uh, ag uh, products, 1,500 to 2,000 an acre, but uh, no subsidies for that. Well, and yeah, the funny thing is too, you go back to that uh, few slides back, 
drought tolerant or, or low water use landscape does not have to be gray rocks, a wagon wheel, and a bull skull, right? It can still be attractive. It is possible. It is possible. So, and that's, that's it's a little creativity goes a long ways and things like that. Yeah. So we've got one more question here, Andy. I, we've got an active audience today. I really oh, I love it. it. So uh, somebody else is asking, what's the uh, general water usage, right? A comparison of, um, you know, a, a, a thousand square feet of shrub versus a thousand or ground cover and a thousand uh, uh, square feet of, of um, turf. Are you going to save by putting in shrubs and, and ground cover 50 percent, 25 percent, 75 percent? Okay, every, every, every place is different. Uh, I can tell you SNWA and so this is the Southern Nevada Water Authority. When we look at the Mojave Desert, Las Vegas. So this, this, this takes in, you know, you could probably apply this partially to Phoenix, but for sure you get the, you know, Barstow, Bakersfield through, you know, that area of California. SNWA estimates is it takes 75 gallons of water per square foot of grass per year to keep that grass alive. When you switch to um, low water use landscape, you know, which doesn't mean ugly and dry. I mean, it's still a beautiful landscape. It's something like, you know, 20 gallons. And I, I, I don't remember exactly. It, it might be between 13 and 30, depending on where you're at. But the, the moral of the story is there's, you know, two thirds to, to half reduction in water bill. Um, what we saw as contractors was about two thirds, about, you know, 65% reduction in water usage going from turf to um, a, a zero scape style environment. Um, and that, that is, that, that, that's real savings. That, that's a uh, documented um, savings, just going from, from turf grass to, uh, to, to shrubs and, and, and desert adapted plant material. It's a huge savings. And, you know, we were talking about the distribution uniformity of an irrigation system. And remember, we said that maybe a spray head uh, average might be between 35% and 50%. So meaning you have to double water to get that rain effect, right? If it's only 50% uniform, you have to add 100% more water to get that uniformity everywhere. When you switch to the shrubs and the ground cover too, Andy, can't you change the way you're irrigating to go to a uh, drip system that uh, is 90% plus uh, efficient? Absolutely. Yeah. Drip, drip irrigation, 90, 95% efficient. Spray irrigation, 30 to 50% efficient. Just, just, just on, on that alone, there's a huge savings in water. But when you go from a high water use plant material like turf to low water use plant material like shrubs, you, there's a big savings. And then when you go from spray, this goes back to the efficiency from spray to drip, there's another savings. So you're, it's, it's compounding the savings there. Um, or co yeah, it's, 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 it goes back to efficiency. Um, it's, it's not just the plant material is using less, uh, we've increased efficiency. That goes back to uh, you know, step one and step two. Um, uh, plant material, reducing plant material demand and re, uh, increasing efficiency. And then with the drip irrigation too, we get into precision control of it as well. We can put the, wa the water right where the plant roots are. So, you know, I, I wanted to mention um, here in step three, 3A, it was, it was match irrigation to plant demands. And I told you, I, I said, I, I talk about how we can do that. And the Easiest way to do that. Now you could sit down with charts and, and calculate this out on a daily basis. How much water does this plant need? The roots are eight inches in the soil. I've got a sandy loam. That means I've got to run it for you know 12 minutes to get the water this deep. And da 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 da. Or you can use technology. And this is step four: adapt new technology. And I, I estimate 15 to 50 percent. I've seen savings as high as 75 percent using uh, technology. And we can we can make a lot of these calculations that I was talking about before in step three by using a smart controller. Why sit down every day, make the calculation when you can have a, a, a computer do it automatically for you. I got a picture of three smart controllers here on the right, but the, the way a smart controller works is it's hooked up to a weather station. So it knows the weather, right? It knows if it's going to be hot or cold, how sunny it's going to be, if it's going to be rain, if there's going to be a lot of wind. It says, okay, based on that weather information um, and based on the plant material you have, 
based on the soil conditions, based on whether or not there's a slope, whether there's extra shade or whatever's going on, I'm going to calculate how much water your plant material needs. We know that plants in the middle of June need water, more water than plants in, in December. It's just, you know, I like to think of it as if I'm out, if I'm out uh, hiking in the hills in June, I drink a lot more water than I do when I'm hiking in December, right? It's the same, the same principle there. So these are called smart controllers. And that can be a huge, huge help to help us uh, conserving water. Now, there's a lot of smart controllers out there. And we've had a couple, uh, several webinars on this channel uh, talking about those. One, a, a great one was uh, done by DJ Caldwell. And it was a smart, smarter, or smartest. How do you decide which smart controller is best for you? So there are varying degrees of intelligence amongst smart controllers. Um, the smartest controllers are going to be using um, uh, premium weather data. And I, I like to talk about on-site weather versus a weather network. Um, a lot of times on-site weather stations, unless it's a high-end state-of-the-art, I'm talking like five, $10,000 weather station, the, the, the value of that data pales in comparison to the weather networks that you can now buy into that are offered, such as you know the weather network that ET Water provides. Um, so having a higher degree of, of, of accuracy in your weather data means a higher degree of accuracy in water conservation through your smart controller. So um, when we talk technology, that's probably the biggest thing that comes to mind are these the smart controllers. But uh, Richard, you mentioned um, before, you know, with the delivery of the water as well, if we go from spray irrigation to drip irrigation and drip irrigation, isn't you know the latest technology but it is much more high tech than spray irrigation i mentioned earlier spray irrigation man that was developed well, in the 1920s 1930s um uh, drip irrigation came out uh, many years after that has been further refined but we look at the efficiency of drip irrigation nearly 100 percent compared to the uh efficiency of spray irrigation is close to 50 percent what that means is all else being equal, I can cut my water usage in half just by switching from spray to drip irrigation. That's a huge savings. Yeah, anytime we can save over uh, 10%, right? We get excited. So 50%, uh, that, that is huge. Yeah. And so when we look at technology here, I look at, you know, I look at that uh, 15 to 50% savings on technology. And then uh, the last, last strategy, last skill here is, is just education. I call that competent operator skills. Um, and I'll put in a plug here for the Irrigation Association. Of course, Jane's always been a big supporter of that. I, uh, uh, we love being involved with the Irrigation Association. There are classes and certifications that are offered to help educate us as landscape professionals, as irrigation water management professionals to help us uh, improve our skills and our abilities. And that continuing education becomes important. Uh, if you're an owner, manager, a leader within a landscape contracting organization, I highly encourage you to take advantage of those classes that are offered um, for, uh, for your employees. Uh, at Jane, we, we spend a lot of, a lot of our time uh, educating as well. Uh, you can call or email me, I would gladly come in and, and, and we have some classes and stuff we can present. For your for your folks as well, um, and really, the, here's the the last question I'll pose to everybody today is is for you contractors or homeowners, do you have the skill set and the ability right now to perform an audit of your irrigation system, for, to perform a survey of your irrigation system to make sure it's operating at peak efficiency, um, precision application of water, and that the the landscape um, you, you know is using water as efficiently as possible. If you have the ability to perform that, you know, more power to you. I hope you're performing that um, regularly. If not, then uh, I encourage you to get some classes under your belt so you can perform those audits. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great point, Andy. Uh, uh, there's a lot of places we can get educated on doing that now too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the webinars like this, uh, website's got uh, the Jane, janesusa.com has a lot of good uh, resources. The Irrigation Association is, uh, is, is filled with these, uh, with these um, uh, resources as well. And uh, I, I, you know, I'll throw up my, my email address and telephone number. If you have any questions on where to find those resources, uh, give me a call. Um, 
email, more than happy to help uh, uh, in any way I can. Yeah, really great job today, Andy. Um, and I want to ask you about this, your telephone number, email address. It's really okay for anybody to call and ask you a question about uh, irrigation or even horticulture. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, I'd say to the guys in Colorado right now, don't call me and beat me up because the Knights beat the Avalanche. But if you want to call about water, we can, we'll discuss that. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, all right, well, that's a pretty generous offer. And again, Andy, uh, great job today. Uh, thank you to all of you who uh, tuned in today. We really appreciate it. And uh, remember, all our trainings are on the janesusa.com website uh, site, forward slash trainings. We're also wherever you um, listen to your favorite podcasts, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio. And uh, we just learned today, we're the number one uh, podcast for uh, irrigation training by uh, Feedspot, uh, uh, so uh, website. So this is uh, really good news. Again, Andy, thank you. Thanks to all of you out there. And uh, we will uh, see you back here on Friday where we've got Michael Pippen talking about agro-tourism. This is something that's really changing uh, the way uh, people look at farming and food, and more importantly, uh, uh, I think, how to drive revenue uh, out, out of this. So uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, topic on Friday as well. Okay, thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you later. Thanks again, Andy. Great job. You're welcome. Thank you.